Between 1851 and 1937, the America's Cup offered us many magnificent races that forged the reputation of the Cup. The matches of 1901 were particularly disputed between Shamrock II, the new Sir Thomas Lipton boat designed by George Lennox Watson, and Columbia, already winner in 1899, a drawing by Nat Harishoff. On the morning of October 4, 1901, the regatta committee's boat navigator took her position about 300 yards north by east of the Sandy Hook lightship. She displayed the international code letter D, which meant that the race was to be over a triangular course of 30 miles, 10 miles to each leg. The first and second legs were set so as to be broad reaches. The third leg was to be the windward leg. The exact conditions at this time were wind north-northwest, freshening to her speed of 10 knots, sea smooth tide at the top of the flood. The following comments are from the New York Times article published the day after the race. When the warning gun was tired both were just to leeward of the lightship, which was at the southerly end of the line. They now stood across the front of the line, Shamrock holding the leeward course, but ahead of Columbia. A photograph of the Detroit Publishing Company illustrates this moment. Columbia and Shamrock II maneuvering for the start. October 3rd, 1901 is available on the Library of Congress website. At the Winewood end of the line, Shamrock bore away, and Columbia followed in her wake. Shamrock laughed up and went on the starboard tack. Columbia did the same under her opponent's lee. Both were now heading back toward the line outside of the navigator. Columbia bore away first and passed around the navigator's bow ahead of Shamrock. It was now a question of what tactics the skippers would adopt. The racers were to go away with the wind a little above their beams on a reach and most expert racing skippers, having to sail the allowing boat would have chosen to send the other boat away first with the allowance as a present. The only question yesterday was whether Captain Sycamore would have this or go first and take the chance of having Columbia out into his weather blanket and pass him on the very first leg. Shamrock now dived and, breaking out her jib topsail, rushed across the line. Instead of crossing the line after his opponent, Captain Barr pushed Columbia way up to windward and then tacked. And now, having let Shamrock get a lead of over a minute and a half, Columbia raced across the line, breaking out her jib topsail. The race was now on. Shamrock crossed the line at 11 hours 0 minutes and 13 seconds and Columbia at 11 hours 1 minute and 47 seconds. All that Captain Barr had now to do was to catch Shamrock and hold her and he would have a victory of 2 minutes and 30 seconds. As soon as the yachts were fairly on their course it was seen that Shamrock stood up better than Columbia, but this was only temporary. The wind was coming off the land in heavy puffs, and first one yacht would lie down and then the other. A way out ahead of Columbia was her tender, the steamboat Park City, and it was plain that the defender of the cup was following her and not the buccaneer. It must be remembered that the New York Yacht Club has eliminated the element of navigation from these cup contests. Skippers do not have to hunt for marks now but are provided with a guide boat which steam along the course a couple of miles ahead of the races and shows them the way. But Columbia, in addition to this, has had her own private guide boat in the Park City, and yesterday, on the first leg of the course, at any rate, she followed this boat and not the official guide boat. The services of the latter were utilized by Shamrock, 
when Captain Barr decided that the American yacht had eaten as far up into the wind as it was healthy for her to go. He slacked away his main sheet a bit and eased her. Her mainsail was flat, but it seemed to have no bad effect on her, and she did not run up into the wind nearly as much as Columbia. It was 11.25 when Columbia eased her main sheet, or when the yachts were just halfway to the first mark. As they drew near to the mark, Columbia bore away a little, and Shamrock eased her main sheet. To round the mark, it was necessary for both yachts to jibe. Shamrock rushed down on the mark, which loomed clear and sharp against the bright blue sky, and she made as pretty a jibe as any sailorman could wish to see. Columbia was plainly close upon her heels, and she too went around the mark in the most skillful manner. The skippers were not taking any chances of carrying away anything, and main sheets were gathered in and turns caught around cleats as the booms went over. Shamrock rounded the mark at 11 hours 51 minutes and 10 seconds and Columbia at 11 hours 52 minutes and 22 seconds o'clock. The Challenger held everything as it was, for the wind was about the same on this leg as on the first, except that it was on the other side of the yachts. The force of the wind had been increasing, and it now was about 15 knots an hour, while the puffs were even speedier. As they neared the second mark the wind was at the top of its force, and neither yacht could carry the jig top sail quite to the turn. As the yachts near the mark Columbia eased off to leeward so as to make a turn close to the mark. Shamrock rounded first at 12 hours 45 minutes and 57 seconds. Columbia following at 12 hours 46 minutes and 39 seconds. On Anthony Blake's magnificent painting, we can see the Corsair II, the 241 feet yacht with black hull of John Pierpont Morgan, owner of Columbia, and Aaron. The 260 feet yacht with white hull of Sir Thomas Lipton, owner of Shamrock. Rounding the mark, Shamrock called up on the starboard tack, but Columbia, on rounding the mark, went on the port tack. This placed Shamrock on Columbia's weather, about 300 yards to windward. And now began the last struggle. Columbia went on the starboard tack at 106. Shamrock tacked almost at the same instant on Columbia's lee bow. On the new board Shamrock held the leeward berth, but was ahead. Both yachts were lying down to the work in magnificent style, but Columbia's speed was the greater. At 1 hour 20 minutes and 35 seconds the Challenger was thrown to the port tack. 15 seconds later, Columbia went on the same tack, and now it was plain that she was to windward. In a few minutes she had the Challenger a quarter of a mile dead under her lee. The race was over, and Columbia could not lose unless she carried away her topmast. This port tack proved to be a very long board for both but finally at 1 hour 57 minutes and 10 seconds Shamrock led the way to the starboard tack, and Columbia followed in 5 seconds. When Shamrock tacked she was directly astern of Columbia as the latter came about and the defender had a lead of a quarter of a mile on the same tack. From this tack to the end it was a procession, with the defender in the van. Both laughed a little to windward of their course but eased off as they neared the mark. Two documents illustrate this crucial moment. A lithography by W.G. Wood published in the Lawson's History of the Americas Cup by Winfield M. Thompson and Thomas William Lawson. And a photograph of Henry G. Peabody at the Library of Congress. Both laughed a little to windward of their course but eased off as they neared the mark. Columbia approached the line at railroad speed, and rushed across it at 2 hours 15 minutes and 5 seconds, a glorious winner, amid the cheers of the spectators and the wild shrieks of a hundred whistles. Shamrock followed 1 minute and 18 seconds later, a thoroughly beaten boat. Over the entire course Columbia beat Shamrock 2 minutes and 52 seconds. By corrected time Columbia won by 3 minutes and 35 seconds.